All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Didn't really hear anything. Is there anyone out there? Uh, good evening. All right, good. That's better. Thank you. Um, so I'm delighted uh, this evening that we have Jeff Dunn with us. Uh, I'm going to just uh, remind you a little bit about uh, what we're doing over this uh, fall semester. So in addition to uh, Jeff this evening, uh, we have um, a special event on October 24th. October 24th is United Nations Day. And what we're doing on October 24th, and especially relevant to all of the students here, um, is we've invited all of the consuls and consuls general uh, in Miami uh, to come here for an event that evening. Uh, someone has uh, clicked the mic. Okay, it's back. Um, we've invited all of them to come here this evening. We have 75 or 79 countries represented in the student body of Miami Business School. Uh, so we thought it would be a nice way of celebrating United Nations Day to bring them together with the uh, consuls of the countries uh, that they are originating from. So that, that'll be a very special event. Uh, there'll be a little program in here first, and then we'll have a reception afterwards. Um, we have uh, Geisha Williams with us on November the 2nd as part of our reunion events. Uh, but this one we're opening up to the uh, broader community. Uh, Geisha Williams is the first Hispanic woman to be the head of a Fortune 500 company. Uh, and as many of you know, she's an alum of the University of Miami. Um, we then have our November 1st uh, to 3rd homecoming and reunion events. It's the 70th anniversary of the uh, uh, MBA program. Uh, Dean Chagru, who is uh, here this evening, is the uh, Honorary Chairman of the uh, Organizing Committee um, and uh, was Dean for uh, a good part of uh, the 70 years. No, I won't go that far, uh, but uh, maybe uh, 12 or so, 15? 15 years. So very important part of the history of uh, the school that we'll be celebrating during the 70th anniversary. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Ron Williams. Now, this is one I really want to note uh, particularly for your attention and put this one in your calendar because um, you may not have ever have heard of this gentleman, but he is uh, the former CEO of Aetna uh, and now serves as a non-executive director on many public company boards, including as the lead director of American Express. There's no one I've met in the United States who knows more and thinks more deeply about corporate governance uh, from a practitioner point of view than uh, Ron Williams. And then finally, um, as uh, you need, I know those of you who come here regularly need no reminder of this one because uh, you've all put this one in your calendars already because um, there will be libations uh, available and this seemed like a very appropriate uh, a very appropriate individual to have uh, in the uh, run-up to the Christmas season. So that's the, uh, the lineup, and uh, now I just want to introduce Jeff a little bit. Um, Jeff has, uh, for four years, been uh, the head of Sesame Workshop. Uh, Sesame Workshop is a global organization. Uh, its products and services are sold in 150 countries. Um, Jeff uh, started uh, his uh, education at uh, Harvard as an undergraduate, uh, then uh, was a professor in Harvard, I beg your pardon, a student at Harvard Business School for his MBA. Uh, he went to work for Time Magazine uh, and has spent most of his career in the uh, media and entertainment field running uh, networks like uh, Nickelodeon and after that HIT. Uh, he took a time out in 2014 uh, and then was approached at that time by uh, Sesame Workshop to see whether or not he could help them. Uh, they were running a large deficit and uh, he ended up uh, taking the leadership role at Sesame Workshop and uh, uh, turning Sesame Workshop around big time and that's really the story. Uh, that I think Jeff is going to share with us this evening. So, 
thanks a million for uh, coming down, uh, and uh, we really appreciate it so much, Jeff. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm um, I'm delighted to be here. I. Uh, I don't know whether I should have been here on UN Day, though. Um, that sounds like it's pretty good. For those of you who can't see, I'm wearing um, the tie of all the countries that Sesame's in. And uh, we'll talk more about that. So um, I want to, whoops, is that moving? Sorry. Let me go backwards. Because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I may just come out here and do this. Can you turn my mic on, actually? We're not coordinated on this. So, um, I really want to um, thank John for inviting me to come down and talk at what I think is a historic point in time. We are living at a time right now that um, I think history is going to treat in a very um, important way as to what is going on in so many issues. But here are ones that we're thinking about at Sesame. So we know that technology and demography and politics are upending lives and it's having an impact on kids. So we know about job loss, you know about job loss. You know it's moved from developed countries to less developed countries. We know that the most developed or undeveloped countries are the ones that are growing the fastest, but they have the least education. We know that nativism is taking over around the world. In technology, data gathering has changed people's sense of security uh, and, and how they are thinking about their sense of privacy. We are more tethered today with our phones but less emotionally connected than we have ever been. And it has caused a large amount of mental health issues with young people today. And as a result, technology and politics and demography have upended the culture that kids are growing up in, and it is a very toxic culture now. Um, so in this environment, Sesame has been asking itself a bunch of questions. What have we learned? How can we help? What new goals should we set for ourselves? And the first thing I want you to understand is about brain development. Most brain development happens in the first five years of life, 92% by the age of five. And synapses form and then start eroding by the age of three. It's why kids can learn a language so quickly and why the rest of us um, it's very difficult for. But what this means is that the earliest years are the ones that matter most for education. If you don't get the educational enrichment and nourishment during those first five years, it is almost impossible to make it up later in life. So we focus on those early years. We focus on preschool because that's when it matters. We focus on getting kids access to education who wouldn't normally get the same access as they might if they were living in wealthier communities. And we use the power of media to do it. We were born 50 years ago. 50 years ago this year, our organization nonprofit was created. 50 years ago next year is when we were first went on the air. And it was a time very similar to today. There was a lot of unrest of those who were around and remember it. Civil unrest, racial unrest, inequality. And we were an experiment. We were designed to be an experiment. We're still experimenting. Every day we experiment. Um, but this was one where a nonprofit Carnegie and Ford gave the money, the Harvard Graduate School of Education helped work out the curriculum, and we came up with a model that was all about research-based um, educational curriculum delivered through television, and we're still using it today. Oh, you've never seen a street like Sesame Street. Everything happens here. You're going to love it. They're playing games. Hi, Bob. It began in 1969 with a simple but powerful idea. Uh, what's the idea of this show? Well, the idea is to teach little preschool kids some stuff that'll be useful to them in school. Could using the power of media help children everywhere reach their highest potential? 16. The Children's Television Workshop presents Sesame Street. Oh, that's a great title, Kurt. Can you tell me what this is? Stairs. Okay, and can you tell me... There's a lot of research on the effects of Sesame Street, and it's very convincing to me that when children watch Sesame Street, it makes a huge difference in their knowledge of concepts that will help prepare them for school. And by the time those children get to high school, uh, their grade point averages are about 16% higher. That's a big effect. What that does, it has a cascade effect on children who, over time, will continue to achieve because they will get off to the right start. We've taken our proven model for early education across the globe, 
where local partners help us meet the specific needs of each country. Well, Afghanistan is a great example. I mean, this is a country with five million children under the age of five, and only a third of them um, are in school. Our production in Afghanistan teaches lessons of tolerance and acceptance and has an emphasis on girls' education, inspiring young girls to learn and dream big. Across the world, there are 1.2 billion children under the age of nine, and 19% of those children live in India. Poverty and circumstance prevent millions of Indian children from having any kind of quality preschool education. So, we bring it to them. Chomki is just this vibrant, wonderful little girl who just loves the world and when a child watches it and sees themselves on the screen and that's the best success of all. Where are you guys? Okay, no hiding, come on. At first, I didn't think she wanted to hug me because she was scared of me maybe. I was nervous. I was afraid it was gonna change the way I was gonna be a father. Here at home, a number of initiatives focus on communities with special needs, like the families of our nation's military. The chaplain sat me down on the couch, and um, I told him, I was like, I have three other sons, I was like, and I'm pregnant. I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? Talk, listen, connect. Before this project, Sesame Street created, there were a few resources to help service members talk to their children about what happens when they are deployed. Is that your daddy's new hair? Yep. Wow! Our program is helping families cope with very difficult issues and reaching out to children in a way that only Sesame Street can. I got you know. Oh, you do? <laughs> These characters are so powerful, and that gives us an opportunity to make a huge difference for children around the world. The need for our mission has never been greater. If we can help kids everywhere to grow smarter, stronger, and kinder, I believe we can literally help to change the world. Thank you. Um, so that tells you what, what we do. Now, what I hope you took away from that was the theory of change that we, um, we have. And it's really these three things. First, early education matters. Second, that um, media can actually educate very cost effectively and build to large scale. The model of a classroom with kids and a teacher is actually an expensive model. It's a wonderful model, it's the best model, but it's an expensive model. And there's so many places in the world that you cannot get those classrooms to. So media can reach where others can't, and it does it at scale and cost effectively. And the third thing is that it models behavior. You all know from watching television that kids in particular pick up cues and pick up things from this, and they model that behavior. So it can be used to model good behavior, sometimes bad behavior, but we choose to model the good behavior. We are trying to serve up a nutritious whole child curriculum. You can see what uh, we do there, cognitive learning, physical and mental health, um, social and emotional learning, 21st century skills. All of that is packed into the curriculum and the shows that we create. And over four decades, uh, we've now become what's affectionately called the longest street in the world. And we are in over 150 countries. Some of them with uh, original productions, many of them with original productions, with local Muppets, local educators. Uh, local educational philosophies. Um, and along this journey, we've learned some things. So kids can and do learn from the media they consume. It's not a question of whether they learn, it's a question of what they learn. Entertainment matters. You can't, if you can't reach, you cannot teach. We say that all the time. If you can't reach, you cannot teach. And so we have to be entertaining in the way we do it, so we try and use humor in a lot of cases. We have learned over the 50 years that kids learn much earlier and become whole beings much earlier than we originally thought. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, people thought, you know, four or five year olds, now we understand that it's really right out of the womb that kids are becoming whole human beings in many ways and are learning from the get go. And of course, we also know that grown ups matter. So, grown ups matter to how kids learn, and a grown up and a kid learning together is better. 
So flash forward to today, media has changed so much. When we first started you know, 50 years ago, there were just three networks. The average kid started viewing TV at age four. Today, kids are starting four months old on digital tablets. And by the time there are two, they're multitasking and using tablets every day. It's a completely different world. And the kids' media industry is caught up. We're in the kids' media industry. That's how we compete from a business point of view, as it were. Uh, it's never been easier to reach kids, but it's never been harder to actually make a difference. There's so many platforms and there's so much content, it is so hard to cut through it, so it's never been harder. And of course, the ever-present smartphone has literally changed the kids' relationship to each other and um, emotional well-being in many cases. We've never had more mental health problems than we do today with young kids. So this change in the media and that what we have to create also comes at a time when kids themselves are, are dealing with profound issues. Poverty and inequality around the world are at all time highs. Nearly half of the world's three to six year olds don't have access to preschool. So in the years that matter most, nearly half don't have it. A majority of the world's children are affected in some way by violence. That staggers me. A majority are affected by violence at home, in school, and increasingly by war and terrorism. That kind of trauma leads to toxic stress. When you are highly stressed, it creates a chemical reaction in the brain that prevents your brain from developing, particularly when you're young. So if you're highly stressed as a young kid, your brain does not grow to full size. That is a huge issue around the world and one we are trying to deal with. So Sesame believes that media has the power to do good. We believe it has the power to do good and we believe it has the responsibility to do good. It's omnipresent. It can reach and teach at scale. It can promote that adult and child I mean, ed uh, engagement. And it can support some uh, social and emotional development. So I'm sure all of you have heard Wordsworth's famous phrase, but it's one we live by, which is, the, fa the father is child, <laughs> excuse me, the child is father to the man. And what that means is that if you wanna see what a society is gonna look like in uh, 30 years, take a look at how it treats its kids today. So four years ago, I joined Sesame and brought in a new management team and we began to think about what is it that we needed to do to adapt for the next 50 years. I say 50 years because we were about going to be 50 years old, but really it was 25. So the first thing, you can see our mission up there, um, to educate the power of media to help children everywhere reach their highest potential. And we thought that that was not focused and not, um, and not clear enough to what we wanted to do. So we adapted it to be, to help kids who are smarter, stronger, and kinder. You can measure whether kids are growing smarter, stronger, and kinder. And we said we wanted to evolve from being a TV show with a mission to a mission-driven organization that also happened to have a TV show. I don't know whether 10 years from now or 20 years from now, linear TV will exist in the some, same fashion that it does today. So to continue to invest all of our energy in only delivering uh, the mission through a TV show didn't seem to us like a smart idea. So today we deliver content on every platform and even more importantly, we have targeted community social impact programs that reach kids, vulnerable kids, where they live with, um, with helpful education they would not otherwise get. Okay, we decided the best way to help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder was to be great at doing three things. You have a mission, you gotta say how you're gonna deliver on the mission, right? We called it our own MRI. As makers of content for all platforms around the world, as researchers of kid and family behavior, we'd always been about research. We invented the concept of researching uh, whether kids were actually learning from television and so we thought we could not only do it for ourselves, but for society. And then instigators of others who share our mission and our values. If you only work with yourself, if we only are sesame, we can have an impact. 
But if we can instigate others to share our mission and our values and help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder, then we can have a much greater impact. So, where has all, all that got us to? So today, this year, we aspire to make a meaningful contribution to the world, and we are tackling some of the biggest issues in the world today. We are more than doubling our content. That is just a huge thing. We used to have one show. This year, we will have five shows across a variety of media platforms, all of them educationally nutritious and valuable. We've done a deal now with Apple, and we are going to be helping them teach kids how to code, which is probably the world's most important language. We're launching the, early, the largest early childhood development initiative in the history of humanitarian aid. I'll talk more about this in a minute, but we received $100 million from the MacArthur Foundation to help educate the kids affected by the Syrian conflict. In India, which has a Me Too problem, as well as the United States, we are empowering girls. We are helping that society come to grips with the gender inequality that exists, and this is one of the things that we are best at around the world. In China, we got to China, I was telling John this before uh, we started, we got to China right after Nixon opened it up. We are now the largest teacher of English language in China, and we are bringing our whole child curriculum there as well. In South Africa, if you've been following this, this is one of the saddest um, stories actually around the globe today. We got invited in many years ago by Nelson Mandela to help deal with the AIDS crisis. And we created content that would help overcome the stigma of AIDS and help people um, to really understand how you contracted it and how you didn't contract it. We probably saved millions of lives. After he passed away, the, the political party he was a part of became corrupt. And they, their corruption reached deep into the educational framework of the country and looted the schools for, for all intents and purposes. So we've opened an office in South Africa this year, and we are bringing money, we are bringing education, we are bringing um, all kinds of enrichment to the most vulnerable kids in South Africa. And finally, in the US, we, there is toxic stress in the US. Here, it's often poverty or incarceration or divorce or um, alcoholism. All this causes stress on families and kids. And so we've created something called Sesame Street in Communities. And we've piloted it, and we're now rolling it out this year. And it's to work with um, community service providers who work with these at-risk families and to provide them with the educational nourishment and um, uh, the entertainment that for the kids, um, but also to educate parents how to deal with the kids in the stressful situations. All of that is now happening this year. And it makes me, to be honest about it, it makes me dizzy thinking about it. I think any one of those would have been a big undertaking, but we're tackling all of those at the same time. We feel that we are making real progress and we feel like we're making a real difference at an important time in the world. So let me tell you now about a few things um, in a little bit more detail. The first is the show itself. It has evolved. It used to be, when we started, 60 minutes. It is now 30 minutes, but we make twice as much of it. Why do we do that? We do that because kids' attention span has narrowed, and we need to deal with the kids as they are today. So half as long, twice as much. We have added kindness into the curriculum. We had a lot of um, great content around smarter. We had a lot of great content around stronger. We didn't have a lot of content around kindness. And kindness is probably the thing that is needed most in the world today when you think about it. Kindness and respect. And so we thought we should add that. And then we changed um, the way we distributed the, the program. So we've always been on PBS. We will continue to be on PBS. But PBS alone cannot be the only way that we, we reach kids. There's no network anymore that reaches even half the kids in the country. No, no single network. When I was at Nickelodeon, we probably reached two-thirds by ourselves. But nobody reaches even half. So we have to be in all these different places. So we've added HBO to make sure we had SVOD 
and kids could get it anytime, download it anytime they wanted to in full episodes. We've added Univision, which is Spanish language, and now reaches kids who don't speak English. And we have done this landmark deal with Apple. Apple, as you may know, is um, gonna create a content platform that they are going to give away and make part of all 500 million phones that are Apple around the world. So our opportunity to get in front and, and help kids is gonna go up geometrically when that happens, and they have uh, selected us to be their first kids provider, and we are working with them to try and bring educational content so when they debut next year in, in uh, 2019, it will go out across the globe. Something else that we did was around autism. I, I just wanna say, wait a minute, I'm gonna back up and say one other thing. Um, for our people, we won nine Emmy Awards this year. <laughs> And that is the most of any show on television. So let me just um, say that uh, right there. So we, we, um, we were the big winners. And we actually, normally we compete in the daytime because we're a daytime show. But now, because we're on HBO, we actually um, have specials that go at night. And we won an Emmy for our special at night, too. So we were over the moon. Um, OK, so we also did something around autism. Uh, one in 68 kids has autism. And there's a, been a stigma around it. Kids and families know kids that have it. The question for us is, how do we help people understand what it means to have autism? And the kids are different, but they're still amazing. So we created this thing called um, See Amazing in All Children, and we created the first autistic Muppet. Uh, and we put it out there. Nothing, I've gotten done, nothing that we've done has gotten as much feedback to me as what we did here. The parents that have reached out, the letters are, are, are heartwarming. And, um, and so let me show you now what this looks like. Can you, uh, yep, thank you. The folks who've been bringing a Sesame Street for 46 years say that their mission is to help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. And to that end, they're adding a new character. Here's Jim Axelrod. In Sesame Street's new online story, the new kid on the block seems to be a little different. And it's not just Julia's bright orange hair. Hi, Abby calls loudly. Julia doesn't answer. Your friend doesn't like me, says Abby sadly. But since this block is Sesame Street, Elmo's on the job of teaching kids what they need to know. Elmo's daddy told Elmo that Julia has autism he says, so she does things a little differently. Julia's story is part of a campaign to see the amazing in all children. More than six out of 10 children with autism have been bullied at some point. The idea behind Julia is familiarity breeds compassion, and compassion helps reduce that number. The Twitter sphere blew up at the news, like this from at Rudy Regan. Seeing kids like I was depicted positively on a mainstream show, that means a lot to me. The story ends like you might imagine. One, two, three, counts Julia. Yeah, one, two, three friends, counts Abby. With confusion cleared up, friendship triumphant. Sunny day. And the sunny days on Sesame Street, now even brighter. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, New York. That is actually not one of our Muppets. <laughs> the um, uh, Kermit is um, actually Disney owned, but they didn't realize that. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it works, right? It works in the context. Um, OK, so it is our 50th anniversary coming up. I talked to you earlier about research and the importance of research and what we create and still um, the way we do every show. Every show is research. We look at it summatively at the end of it, but we also look at it formatively when we are creating it, and we create, um, you know, they write the show, then we take that out in an animatic, we show it to kids in schools, they look at it, we see if they understand it, if they don't, we go back and we work it, and, and that is the process, and then we go back and say, did it work at the end um, when they actually saw it? So, but now we thought for the 50th anniversary, we really ought to do something big, and we talked a lot about what that project would be, and we came and, um, and centered on identity. How do kids identify themselves? How do they create their self-identity? We know there are red states and there are blue states. Increasingly, there are purple states. Um, we are living in a very divided 
world. And so we were looking at statistics, some of which you see here, um, and we were looking at social attitudes, and we said we need to better understand this. So by 2020, uh, kids, minority kids, are going to be the majority. By 2060, we will be a majority minority country. Um, the number of children living in two-parent households is at an all-time low in 50 years. Uh, religion is changing in this, in this country. So we are less Christian, we are more diverse in our religions, and anybody practicing religion is going down. The amount of religion that people are involved in is actually declining. The number of adults who identify as LGBT is growing. So those are real demographic trends that are coming around that are impacting how kids are growing up. At the same point in time, um, there are social attitudes that are colliding with that. So we're becoming a more diverse country, but despite that, over half the people in the country think racism is a big problem. A third of Americans after Charlottesville in polls said they, said they thought that America should protect and preserve its white European heritage. Two thirds of Americans oppose having a lottery for immigrants. About a third of adults still are opposed to gay marriage. So you've got this huge demographic shift going on. You've got attitudes and social um, attitudes that are grappling with and maybe as a result of that. And in that, kids are trying to form their own self-identity for the future. We want to understand what that is. We want to understand how that is coming to be. So we're going to do a massive piece of research. Um, we've already under started undertaking it, actually. Uh, so we can understand this. How do kids form their self-identity? And what is that self-identity they are going to bring forward 30 years from now that is going to become the society that we are? So we want to understand how it gets created. We want to understand what the role parents play. We want to understand what the role educators play and what role media plays, what role their friends play. Where does self-identity come from in kids? How do people talk about it? Are they talking about it? We want to be able to read this by demographic. We want to be able to read this research by gender, by race, and we want to be able to read it by geography so we can see what the differences are, also by income. Um, so what are we going to do with this? Two things. First is we are going to release it and make it public. We're going to give it to, to everyone so that they can see what are the attitudes that, and how are they being shaped of today's kids. And the second thing we're going to do with it is use it ourselves because we have to create programming and content and educational nourishment for these kids. And how do we do that? What are the issues that we need to address in order to help them become productive citizens tomorrow? So I mentioned earlier social impact work that we're doing. This is where we work with very targeted communities. And a lot of this is taking place in the regions of the world you see on that map. And the biggest thing that we're doing in those regions is working with refugee kids. There are probably no more vulnerable kids in the world than refugee kids. Think about it. Um, I don't, and there may be people here in the audience that are refugees themselves or have been. Uh, you gave up everything. You left your home, you left your goods, you left your family in many cases, and you, you did it because you thought you had to. You went to another part of the world, and there is no educational um, structure for your kid. And if they can't get access to that, they will grow up without it, and that will be a lost generation, and a lost generation begets another lost generation. So we decided that we should do something about that. We thought no other um, kids organization would take it on. We thought no other media company would take it on. Media companies are traditionally interested in selling advertising, which means they're looking for the most wealthy kids they can find to sell advertising to. We're the exact opposite. We're trying to find the most poor and the most vulnerable to help them. So we teamed up with the International Refugee Organization, the IRC, with the preeminent one in the world, and to tackle this. And we piloted a project in Jordan to begin to see how we could bring help to these refugee kids. And then along came the MacArthur Foundation. The MacArthur Foundation launched what I call audacious philanthropy. And they said, we're going to give $100 million to somebody who can solve a significant world problem. And we said, we're in. <laughs> we, we need money. We're in. And 7,000 people applied for that $100 million. Um, you can see how it sort of went through there. By the end, we were the only ones left standing. It was like Survivor. It was a bake-off. It took a year and a half. It was broadcast live on TV. Um, and in the end, we won. And we're using that $100 million to help 9 million kids in the Middle East who are refugees 
um, get an educational start at life. So it's gonna be in three parts. It's gonna be the mass media that we know how to do so well that we'll carpet the whole those four countries with uh, to bring um, content and, and content through entertainment too. Um, and that will happen on television, it will happen on mobile phones, an amazing number of, of refugees have mobile phones, um, as well as digital. Then there'll be in homes. The IRC has 12,000 staff in these countries and they will be using our content to go to homes that have preschool kids zero to three to get this content directly to parents and caregivers and help them understand how to deal with the toxic stress these kids are going through and then how to educate them. And then we're gonna build centers or we're gonna take over centers, I should say, because in many of these cases, the centers are already there in villages and camps and we are gonna kit them out and make them more into classrooms so the kids four to nine can go and get educated. So with that, let me uh, show you what that looks like. Sabah al khair. Sabah al khair. Our early childhood program begins in the home. Whether it's a shelter, a tent, a crowded apartment, it doesn't matter. Kifak ya amin. The most important thing is that the children need to be with their parents, the first caregivers with whom they will build trusting relationships and learn new things in order for them to be able to build knowledge on the long run. Ah, okay. We give them activities to promote reading, learning the alphabet, counting, a lot of language skills. We empower the parents with skills to support their child's development. They can play with them using objects that they can find in their homes. We show them how to communicate with their children frequently in a way that promotes praise. Bravo. Most of the parents that I work with, when we first meet, they describe their role as shelter provider, food provider, as the one who's making sure that their children survive. Yet with time, they start engaging with their children and they would say, I used to do this in Syria, but I was not able to do it anymore with my kids. Thank you for helping me. Wow. <laughs> ضرب أو العاب نارية غزايف يعني قالوا هون ما في شيء ماما هون عادي طبيعي ما عنا مو مثل بسوريا اليوم موعد حفلة عيد ميلادي تنتن نحن بنعرف إنه الأطفال إجوا من بيئة مختلفة بيئة فيها حرب شافوا أشياء ممكن إنه خوفتهم يعني في عندهم حالة إنه غير الأطفال العاديين اللي هني رحين على المدرسة فنحن لحتى نرجع لهم ثقتهم بنفسهم بدنا نحاول نحن نعمل لهم هاي كلهم نعمل لهم المكان الآمن نعمل لهم البيئة الآمنة لحتى هني بيشعروا بالثقة والمدرسة مأمنت له هالشيء فهني أكيد راح تأثر بالمستقبل راح يبنوا مجتمع أكيد راح يكون المجتمع مني مجتمع فعال أكيد so, um that has begun, it will work over the next five years. Um, and we are now trying to raise more money to take on the Rohingya problem in Bangladesh, which is probably even more severe than what you saw there in Syria. I'm gonna um, leave you with this, um, sort of where I began. These are consequential times. We're living in very consequential times. A child is father to the man. If you want to see what a society looks like in 30 years, see how they're treating its kids today. And we take that very seriously. 
and we do not intend to stand by and do nothing. Our role is to try and figure out how to lead in a way that helps kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. I'll leave you with one more that we tell kids. You don't have to go leap in tall buildings. You don't need to run with super speed. You just have to be ready and able to help out when somebody's in need. You can be an everyday hero while at school or at home or at play. You can be an everyday hero to show kindness and caring each day. Invite someone new to start playing If you think that they might need a friend You can paint your grandparents a picture Make a card for them that you can send You can be an everyday hero While at school or at home or at play You can be an everyday hero Just show kindness and caring each day Donate your old books and your toys too Set the table for mama for dad Share your best toy with your brother Or go cheer up somebody who said No, you can't fly You're not made of steel But when you're kind, when you are kind You're a hero for real You can be an everyday hero While at school or at home or at play You can be an everyday hero Just show kindness and caring each day Kindness and caring each day. Show kindness and caring each day. All right. Th th thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, it's a tremendous story. Thank you. Um, We'll open it up for uh, questions. I'm sure many of you have uh, very interesting uh, questions, but I want to persuade you, if I may, to yep. uh, talk a little bit about your personal journey uh, from the Harvard Business School classroom and working for corporate America, selling advertising, and trying to get ratings <laughs> to uh, this world, the not-for-profit world, the NGO world. Yeah. How did that journey evolve, and what, what are the challenges that are different in managing and leading in this world compared to the other? Sure. Well, for my, my personal journey started um, when I was a teenager. I grew up outside of uh, Hartford, Connecticut, which is the poorest state capital in the country. And I grew up in a town called West Hartford, which was a relatively, not an absolutely, but relatively affluent um, white suburb. And my senior year of high school, I was a teacher's aide in the inner city of Hartford at uh, what was an all-black inner city school. I was one of five um, non-African Americans in the school when I was there as a teacher's aide. And the difference that I saw in the education, five miles, I was going five miles. And the difference between that school and what the education I, I was getting astounded me. And I, I just was like, oh my god, this is not fair, it's not right. And, um, and I was incredibly grateful, actually, for the education that I got. Um, so as, as life went on and, and um, I reached a point in my life where I thought I could give back and do something, uh, this came along. I, I, I thought I wanted to go into public service in some way or a nonprofit, and, and this came along. And I thought, wow, I, I actually know something about kids. And, um, uh, and I think I can make a difference at a time that is, as I said, consequential. I, I really do believe that history is going to treat these times in a way that said it mattered to what happened to the future in a way that you know, very rarely comes along. So, um, so I, I, I came to Sesame with the idea of bringing the discipline, managerial and financially, of a for-profit person to a nonprofit, and saying, I said to everybody here, if not Sesame Who, what we should do is figure out what no one else will do. No one else will take this on, that's what we should do. And that's what you see here today. Mm -hmm. how, how did you manage the change in mission and um, the obvious uh, challenges of moving from a loss-making uh, and perhaps overstaffed organization to something that's totally different today. So what John's referring to there, loss-making, um, before I got there, we had lost money for eight years in a row. We were burning through, we're a nonprofit, we were burning through the endowment. Um, I inherited a, 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 a budgeted loss of $19 million. Um, today, we're, we're back being profitable. It was not really about um, cutting the cost, it was about growing the revenues and finding new ways to do things and new ways to engage. So 
everything from doing deals with HBO and Apple and winning the MacArthur Prize, and all of these things have built the revenue and built out the mission. Um, but the part about figuring out the mission was a, was a collective across the company. It was like when I got there and said, you're trying to help kids reach their highest potential? How do you measure that? How do you know if you help the kid reach their highest potential? I have no idea. And the more I asked people, the more they didn't know. But smarter, stronger, and kinder, we can measure that. We can tell whether a kid's getting smarter. We can tell whether a kid's getting stronger or kinder. Um, so measurable results matter, and, um, and it was more focused, and I think it's more consumer friendly. Most people who see that remember it, actually. <laughs> so um, anyways. And do you have any longitudinal studies that uh, you're funding or have been conducted to, to prove that? Um, it's not so much longitudinal studies, uh, John, but it is, what we do is we take the, um, the shows out and we actually look at before and after with the shows. And what we're doing, of the $100 million that MacArthur is funding for the work with the refugees, 15 million of it is going to research. It's a huge budget. And they're, they're testing all these kids, um, you know, a sampling of them across these four countries to understand you know, where they are emotionally, understand where they are educationally, then we will go in and we will uh, do our thing, so to speak, and they will test along the way again, and finally they will test at the end of five years to see what the difference is that we've made. But it's not longitudinal in the sense of every five years where you're going back to the same kids. Okay, all right, yeah. Let, let's uh, open it up for questions. I'm sure there are, there are plenty of questions here. Uh, do we have the mics uh, available? Great. Um, let's take the uh, gentleman at the back there uh, first. Hi, uh, my name is Brendan, I'm an undergraduate student. And uh, my question was, uh, you talked about identifying toxic stressors within mm -hmm. uh, communities and yeah. also developing curriculums to kind of like address that. And I was wondering, which of the two do you focus on more and which do you think is like harder, identifying the toxic stressors or developing the uh, curriculum to address those kind of things? Well, we think we know what the toxic stress is, if I'm understanding your question. Um, we think we know what the toxic stress is, so we're spending a lot of time um, figuring out how to address it. If you think about today, uh, the issues of ABCs, one, two, threes, and social emotional issues like toxic stress, the toxic stress is becoming more important in some ways than the one, two, threes. If they have problems with toxic stress, they can't even hear in some ways the one, two, threes. So dealing with these kids around the world emotionally is become every bit, if not more important uh, it's certainly, in this project, a huge part of what we're going to do. We have to help them cope with the terrorism and the war that these kids are going through. Imagine what, you know, what they're sort of dealing with here. So, um, so we're trying to do both, but a huge part of what we do now is about how do you help a kid understand what stress is doing to them and how they can, what uh, coping me mechanisms they can deploy. We have a whole show now that's come out that's, um, that's uh, going to debut. And um, it's on teaching kids how to cope with these kinds of things, and belly breathing, and how to calm themselves down, and all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. Next to uh, Paul. Hi, I'm John Cudahy, and I was <clears throat> extremely excited when I read that you were coming in, because to a certain degree, our, our, our careers were in parallel. I've been in the international distribution business my whole career, and I was at ESPN and okay. 80 in the History Channel, New World yep. Entertainment, and then eventually Sony Pictures. Um, my question today is, I'm migrating from that into the health and wellness field, specifically in China, opening up pediatric care centers. And I'm wondering if Sesame Workshop is interested in, in joining in with the medical piece uh, in a country like China, where there's 254 million children, and you know, not enough education and not enough uh, right. medical for that matter. Well, let's start with, we, yes, we're interested in China because <laughs> there are millions of uh, kids there. Um, we are just dipping our toe, actually, I guess I could say it that way, uh, in the water in this, in Japan. So in Japan, we are now working with um, health clinics because health clinics need a way to get health information to kids. And our expertise is how you communicate concepts to kids sometimes. And we have a lot of different expertises, I guess, but one of them is educating kids about a variety of issues, health and hygiene. A lot of the work we do in India is around health and hygiene. Anyways, in Japan, we are now partnering with health clinics to try and bring um, health information to kids. 
We have not started that in, in China. What we've been focused on in China is uh, teaching English, to be honest about it. Uh, but I'm certainly open to it, if so if you want to see me. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll take uh, Mauricio for a moment and then go uh, back to the uh, lady at the, f the back. So here in this auditorium normally comes a lot of, of not kids, but a lot of students that are right now yeah. doing their careers in, in, in UM. What lesson would we, should we take or should your recommendation of helping these young adults to grow smarter, stronger, and kinder? Lessons that we can bring from Sesame Workshop to our uh, uh, students today. So I think um, that we've also been doing research on, on something that I'm going to answer this question with. Um, we'd like to, for our 50th anniversary, try and help heal the country a bit. It's very polarized. So we've been doing a lot of research uh, about this with both red states and blue states. And the great thing is we find that we are one of the most, um, I guess, loved institutions by all people around the country. But the number one issue that they say that we provide that the world is lacking right now is the word respect. People do not respect each other. They do not respect differences. They are not open to this. So I would say to everybody, start with respect and follow with kindness. Okay, good. Uh, let's, let's go to the lady at the back. Yeah. Hi. Hello? Oh, it is, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Leah Cohen and I'm a first year student here at the U, I'm undergraduate. Um, Congratulations. As chief executive <laughs> officer, how do you believe you implemented your own ideals and your managerial skills um, for your, the new advanced social projects that you mentioned while still sticking to the traditions, missions, and like ideals of the infamous Sesame Workshop? I think one of the biggest things I did, um, you know, turnarounds are hard. Um, success begets success. You know, and we've been on a roll, and the roll sort of continues, but failure begets, uh, in a way, failure. And so when I came, I had to change the culture of the institution. And, and the first thing that I did that I still do is a variant of this, which is I do, um, at every quarterly staff meeting, I do Q&A. But it's anonymous. So the questions don't come from you right now. They come from you written out ahead of time. And, um, and so people ask, what they really want to know, what they really want to, you to tell them, uh, you know, everything from layoffs to, um, you know, to why did this person get promoted? I mean, they're incredibly detailed questions. And, um, and I believe in transparency. I think the only way you can lead is really through transparency, and it's the value that I bring. And I think it has helped to change the culture of the workshop. It was, a, it was an organization that was, I, I might say it this way, and I'm, I'm sad to say it this way, but it was not living up to the values that it espoused on TV. And one of the things I try, have tried to do there is say, whatever we're putting on TV is what we gotta live internally. And I think it starts with giving people access to senior management uh, to, to ask whatever they want. I, I'll, I'll end with, with this thought. I think my job has three bosses. I work for the trustees. They're the people that hire and fire me. I think I work for the employees. If I can't lead the employees in a way that uh, they are down with, I, if I couldn't get elected to my job, I shouldn't have my job. And then the last thing that I think I work for is vulnerable kids. Who else speaks for these kids? They don't have any power. They need somebody to speak for them. So we speak for them, and it is my job to speak for them. So that's what I would say. I bring those ethics and those values to this job. Let me ask you a tough question since uh I haven't had a chance to ask him a tough question since uh, 1980 <laughs> uh, when I had him in class. I could tell you a whole story about that one. <laughs> Do you think you're stretched too thin? Me personally or the organization? Either. I worry about the organization being stretched too thin every day. Um, I think it's just as hard to grow rapidly as it is to do turnarounds. So when you take a look at the work that we're doing there, people are, I know that people are stretched. Uh, we are growing. We've, we're, since I've been there, um, we've added, uh, we've almost doubled the revenues and we've added 25% more people. So it's, we've added people, but it's not the same as the revenues. So people are stretched and I understand that. Um, but, it's a, but it's a good stretch. Um, 
Am I overstretched? I, I don't know. I, I, um, I love what I do. I think in order to, you know, I, I have all kinds of views about the CEO job and what you have to do, but one of the things that I think is really key, you have to like to solve problems. Because anybody who can solve a problem will solve the problem before it gets to you. So the only thing they pass up the line, ultimately, are the things that they can't deal with, they can't fix, they can't, whatever, right? So if you don't like solving problems, and I have worked for people who hated solving problems, and it's like, oh my God, I mean, that's your job, right? I can't solve this, you're supposed to solve this. <laughs> so so the, I, I don't look at it that way. I love solving problems. And the problems that I'm working on right now are some of the biggest problems in the world, and that excites me every single day. Terrific. Um, in the middle um, with the white t-shirt. Hello. 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 Okay, great. Uh, hi, my name is Amir. I'm a junior here studying public health. I'm an undergrad. Um, my question is, how does your curriculum establish a balance between implementing effective coping strategies for children while also maintaining cultural sensitivity in Middle Eastern countries? So, for example, like in country X, they might be in the culture, they might be giving a set certain gender more preference than we would in the United States. Yeah. So how would you build a curriculum for a child that is exposed to that kind of culture outside your teaching and your curriculum? So when they go home or when they go like out with their family, they're exposed to a whole different culture than you're teaching them. Th this is the great thing about TV. As I was saying, modeling behavior actually changes people's um, uh, opinions about things. And the other thing is, if you want to change society, start with changing a kid. Kids impact adults in ways that um, almost adults can't do. I, I can talk to adults all day long, but when their kid comes home and tells them, mom or dad, you know, we need to do this or think about this, you know, um, ecology. Ecology was led by kids. It still is, is led by kids. Let's take Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we know that it is a patriarchal society in which women have not been allowed to be educated. We know that in every country in the world that women are not equal partners, they do less at GDP, they do, are, their health is less, right? They're a less successful country on every, every measure. It's only when women are equal partners that, that that happens. And so we try and take, preach around the world, educate girls, and we did a whole program where we had a, a girl Muppet um, that was the main character in Afghanistan, and that has made a difference. And we have seen through research that dads now say, I should educate my daughter. They're actually beginning to model the behavior because their kids have seen it and they've watched it with them and they now know it's an important thing and they've seen through the work that we do what happens when a girl gets educated. So, um, so yes, we, we, uh, we listen to what's going on in the country and then we work with local educators to say, what's the big issue, how can we help, and frequently gender, Promotion is one of those issues. Um, let's take uh, the student with the gray t-shirt first. Hello. Hello. Um, you talked about cutting through the conglomerate of just massive online media that is so accessible to tons of kids. Yeah. And I was wondering if you ever looked into pairing up with content creators, independent content creators, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, because these people are incredibly influential with <coughs> these little kids and basically anything they say will go in these kids' minds. And I was just wondering if you had ever considered running a campaign with these people, or maybe not a campaign, but just um, including them in your content somehow um, and trying to reach kids that way. Um, so we are constantly talking to new um, creators. We created something called Sesame Studios Online which was to try to reach out to everybody who wanted to be involved digitally and were making videos. But the thing is, it has to be educationally nutritious. It can't be what is the biggest thing on the internet, which is unboxing videos. So for kids, if you're following this, right, they, you know, they'll, they'll watch unboxing. It's like the craziest thing, but it's, it's engaging. But it's not teaching them anything. We're in the business of trying to teach something. So, so yes, we reach out. Uh, we have a whole program for reaching out. Uh, but it's got to be educationally nutritious for us to partner. Uh, the lady behind uh, the previous question. In white. Hello, my name's 
Yep. Hello, my name is Julia. I'm also an undergraduate student. Yep. I was wondering how you balance the pursuit of Sesame Workshop's educational mission with typical like business prerogatives and competitiveness. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that is um, in some ways why I'm here doing this job. Um, because Sesame was losing because it wasn't playing by the business principles. When I, when I came, um, I said to everybody, there is no nonprofit TV business. There's only the TV business. And it's an urgent business. We were getting ratings quarterly. In, in the world I came from, we got them every morning. We could see how the show was doing every single day. How did you do last night? You could adjust. I mean, it was like a totally different thing. And so we had to get urgent. We had to become outwardly focused. When, when, I, when I got the job, somebody <laughs> who knew Sesame well, um, but hadn't worked there, but knew Sesame well, who I knew, came to see me. As a, whenever you take a new job like this, a lot of people come to see you and pitch you and whatever. So he came to see me, and he said, congratulations, you have a job just like Pope Francis. And I did what some of you were doing. I, I laughed out loud. I said, that's ridiculous. You're suck up. You're looking for something. I forget it. I do not. He said, no, no, listen to me. He said, he said um, you've taken over um, an, not only you know, an iconic, but an iconoclastic institution. It's small, but it punches way above its weight. It's run by an entrenched college of cardinals, and they're running the place based on long-established dogma. And your job, like Pope Francis, is to blow the doors open on this church and bring it into the 20th century. And I thought, dear God, I do have a job like Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it doesn't work in academia. <laughs> okay. And so blowing the doors open and bringing the real world in to this without losing the mission is the hardest part of the job. How do we balance mission and money? How do we make the trade-offs? that generate the revenues, but also stay true to the mission. There's probably not a week that goes by that some issue doesn't arise where we have to think about, is this the right thing to do um, you know, for the mission kind of thing, even if it doesn't make money? Or in the, uh, in the other way, it makes money, but is it the right thing to do for the mission? And it is both art and science. And it is that, that balance, that yin and the yang, that um, will determine my success or not. <laughs> And, and, and so far, it's going okay. <laughs> good, good question, Julia, thanks. Uh, let's go to the uh, lady immediately next to you who also had a hand up. We'll take one or two more and then we'll wind down. Sure, thanks. Hi, my name's Amy, I'm also an undergraduate student, and I'm curious if you can give us a glimpse of what your day-to-day -day tends to be like, if there is any sort of norm to it. Um, my day-to-day -day is just incredibly meeting-driven. And um, the constant of my day is that it's never constant. So the day, you know, I don't think there's a day that goes by that the schedule that starts with the day is the way that the day actually goes and happens. Uh, but it's incredibly meaning driven. Either people inside who are looking to, to um, do things and, and want answers or want you know, insights. But I also meet with a lot of people outside. There are a lot of people, we are an iconic institution and there are people who want to um, be with us, talk to us, use us, whatever it is, and so I meet with a lot of those people. And so um, I would say that is, um, that is my day, whether it's uh, meeting with employees, meeting with the people that report to me, meeting with people externally. When I went to, um, I, I just made a whole trip to India, Bangladesh, United Arab Emirates, and I was doing everything from meeting with ambassadors and trying to get them on board to do certain things to trying to convince people to build a theme park that would, um, you know, around Sesame, that in the UAE, um, it's an incredibly varied day. Um, and, and, and sometimes my brain explodes from the, to the last questioner, from the mission to the money, because in any day, both are sort of coming into play, and you have to like turn your brain off here and, and, and then go here, which is a lot like what kids have to do, right? When kids go to school, English is not the same as math or history or any of that stuff. They have to turn their brains off and, and pivot and move. I have to pivot and move every day. Last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about this, um, and this is one of the things that makes you know, life really hard. I, figure, I, I don't answer emails during meetings, which makes my day really long because most people are during, uh, during meetings, they're also like doing this. But for me, 
most everybody's meeting with me, I'm the reason that they're having the meeting. And so for me to be on emails is completely disrespectful. So um, I have to wait until, for the most part, till much later at night or very early in the morning before I can um, email because of what I do all day long. All right, let's take a couple of quick final ones and we'll take two questions and then we'll uh, close. So uh, okay. the gentleman here. I'm glad you're picking them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, may maybe I think uh, you had a question back there as well, so we'll go to you next, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Heber Rodriguez, I'm here for the graduate program. Yes. Um, my question towards you, I saw that you mentioned introducing a new character for autism. Yes. Um, and I think the strategy is to make kindness for every, be accepted the children who are autistic, correct? Correct. Have you thought about doing th uh, the opposite of that, which, um, introducing something for children who are autistic, and how would you, bet how would you if you do or are doing it, um, how would you measure success? I'm not sure I get the question. Have we so uh, make a program for autistic, autistic children? Just a program for autistic or kids? Or any kind of mental disorder? Uh, well, we, kn we know that um, a lot of autistic kids watch the show and that the show actually works very well for them. I get letters all the time saying to me how well Sesame works for autistic kids. And, um, and we, just, we have a theme park um, in Langhorne, Pennsylvania called Sesame Plays. And that became the first certified autism-friendly theme park in the United States. So we try and take everything we do now and put it through that autism lens and say, is it helpful and good for those kids? Um, and we're measuring the same. We, we just did a research study to find out how many people have seen the Julia stuff. Well, almost half the country has seen it. Um, whether they've learned from it, you know, kind of thing. We, we've done. We research everything, and um, and so we are trying to understand what the impact is having. Okay. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Ricardo. I'm an undergraduate student. I just wanted to make a, a quick comment. When you played the video of the Sesame song playing, I remember as a young immigrant, um, I was trying to learn English, and Sesame Street was the vehicle that I used to learn that. So um, the work that you do is incredibly important. But my question is, um, as Sesame Street partners with um, organizations like the IRC to help refugee children, I'm just wondering if Sesame Street has considered um, taking any initiatives to deal with our own refugee crisis south of the border, or maybe to a lesser extent, um, children that are currently afflicted in detention centers. The answer to that is, uh, is yes. Um, so our, f our fiscal year is um, July 1st to June 30th, and we got our budget approved in like uh, June 20th for this coming year, and right after that, the border thing erupted. And um, I called our uh, chairman of the board and said, rip. <laughs> and so yes, we are taking um, all the same materials that we're bringing to the refugee kids in Syria. Uh, they're in Spanish, they're in English, and we have brought them to the border. Now, one of the things to understand about us is we are not a distributor. We are a creator. So, and and. Very few people have access to those kids. So Catholic Relief Services is the big one that has access to those kids. So we gave all our stuff. We worked with them both in Texas and New York, because New York's another big place, to get those materials that can help those kids into their hands, which are then getting to those kids. But yes, we jumped in um, immediately. Um, can I say one other thing? Um, Suki Lopez who, um, is, is right here. She is Nina on um, Sesame Street. So stand up and take a bow. I just <laughs> saw you there. I and, uh, I know, it was just. Um, um, I, I did not know that she was going to be sitting right there. She, um, she did send me an, an, an email, and um, she's definitely helping kids get smarter, stronger, and kinder. Okay. Do you live in Miami? Uh, no, I do. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. How do you get a job like that? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> All right. I think the uh, gentleman here wanted to. Yeah. Let's take one last bonus question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for, thank you so much for the bonus question. Uh, <laughs> it, it's actually a bonus statement. So I just graduated here yeah. from the law school, okay. and I'm here at my first alumni event at the law school, which is celebrating 20 years of uh, public uh, interest in social justice programs. But last, during my second year, one of those programs I got to do was uh, intern with the MacArthur Foundation. Oh, great. And it was as the 100 and Change program was getting rolling. And when I saw you were speaking here, I was like, I have to run across campus for this. So I just wanted to uh, just say kudos to such, um, just, just such a great uh, program that just like uses creativity for good. And I just wanted to um, 
because I won't have this chance probably again just to say uh, best wishes and um, just much appreciation for your work. Thank so you I guess it was a bonus you. statement. Well, yeah. it was a good, it was a good, fo so good final, good way to end. So, so let, me, let me end uh, with just a, a plea to everybody. Get involved. Do something. The world is at a crucial time. Do something to help us move in a positive direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, uh, ah. so uh, you know what they do at the National Press Club, right? They uh, always give a National Press, Press Club, Club mug, mug, so you have a so Miami Business, Business School, School mug. mug. Well, thank uh, you very much. Thank you so much for I, coming I will, and joining uh, us. I will put that right on my desk. Please. Um, with my MacArthur one, so when, thank you. When, when, when are we going to see it uh, in a Sesame Street episode, though? That's why I'm giving it to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank, does he want to take a picture? Th thanks a lot okay. for coming. Thanks.